thank you all so much for joining us for this discussion following our virtual screening of where olive trees weep. Um, as you have all, we've collectively experienced this incredibly powerful and heartbreaking film. Um, my name is Mahlaka Samdani. I'm with the Community Alliance for Peace and Justice. We are an advocacy group that works in Connecticut and Massachusetts to impact policy and public opinion on issues related to the Middle East and South Asia. For our post-screening discussion, we are so incredibly honored to have with us Ashira Darwish, executive producer of Where Olive Trees Weep. She has joined us so graciously to answer audience questions regarding this incredible film. Uh, just by way of introduction, Ashira Ali Darwish worked for 15 years as a TV and radio journalist and researcher in Palestine with the BBC, Amnesty International and Human Rights Watch. She is the founder of Catharsis Holistic Healing, a trauma therapy project pioneering a type of Sufi active meditation that draws its roots from ancestral and indigenous knowledge. Ashira, once again, welcome and thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for screening the film and for taking the time uh, to speak to me right now, for everybody to be able to breathe Oh, and yes. I, I think after also... the film, we all need an active meditation yeah. ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> but before we begin, Ashira, I just would like to quickly go over the format of tonight's discussion. Um, mm -hmm. It will be moderated by myself, as well as Roxanne Bruno here, who is um, the Community Alliance's uh, board member. Roxanne will get us started with the opening question, and then we will turn it over to audience Q&A. Um, we will ask everyone who's joined us today to please submit your question in the Q&A function, and we will try and get to as many as possible. So without further ado, I'm just going to turn it over to Roxanne. Okay, thank you. Um, Ashira, I, I am so grateful that you worked on that film. Um, I'm still processing. It was incredibly painful difficult and yet hopeful to watch that film. Um, and the first thing that I, th I thought I wanted to ask was, you actually worked on the project in 2022, and that was even before the, the heinous war on Gaza that is happening now. Um, so everything that was in this film is even more true today, if that's even possible. So two years have passed and it is even worse today. I think I think it's fair to make that statement. Yeah. And so what I really wanted to know is what are your hopes for what will happen once people see this film? What are your hopes for what can change in the world after people see this film? Thank you, Roxanne. Um, so yes, definitely, it's far worse than we had ever imagined it could get to, um, sadly. And it's um, it's sad that we had to release this film right now because it, it was meant to be that this film will be part of a longer film format for on intergenerational trauma. Um, but because of the aggression and what is happening in Palestine, and I don't call it a war, I call it an escalation in the ethnic cleansing, because the ethnic cleansing started in 1948, and it just escalated in the last round uh, since October 7th. Um, and yeah, what 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 we what I hope um, we get people to do, and what I hope this film does is it shows that reality that this has started and this has been ongoing for 76 years and this didn't start yesterday that's one one main point for people to to go to walk out with and at the same also to push them to move to push them into action to push them to take immediate action and to recognize that they should not be supporting genocide in their homes so to to make it as simple as not going and buying a uh, McDonald's so that one dollar doesn't go to a bullet, doesn't go to a rocket that's going to kill a Palestinian child, to stop buying Starbucks and start looking for what products 
I'm shocked that there's still sabra being sold in the streets and people in, in shops and people are buying hummus in the United States made with the blood of Palestinian children. Um, so what I want is I want people to move um, to end this, not only for us, but for them, because this is this is on their, their conscience. Every, every, every American is paying $25, uh, $25 to, the, to Israel so that they can continue this genocide. So people are directly responsible. People are that have a voice and they need to use it. So you see activism, you see people, regardless of which country they're living in, being responsible for speaking, yes. telling their, their governments, their legislators that they want this to stop. Yeah. And that is that is the dream of of making this at this point. Um, and then the, is there still a larger project, Ashira, for you to finish the work that you were intending to finish? Yes, yeah, so inshallah in in October um uh, is the aim uh Sand aims to release the um to release the to release the film. And it talks about intergenerational trauma across the world uh, it looks at the indigenous trauma it looks at the genocide um that has been done to all the tribes and in native communities around the world and what this means in the cycle that we're in um because it also started the united states this is not their first the, this is not their first rodeo um keep for some people it's easier to talk about the genocide in palestine than to admit that there's and it, there's a genocide still continuing against the natives and the black and brown uh, bodies in this country. There's, it's it's easier to look outside than to look inside and within. And I hope that also that the the upcoming film will will make this even clearer uh, that you cannot just continue to walk the earth without recognizing what has been done to the natives of this land and this land and that land and Palestine everywhere. Ashira, I, and I'm sorry, I should be turning it over to Malika, but we have an audience member who asked this question many, many times during the screening and is is also the first question in the queue um, to ask this of you. This person is an activist and this person makes films and, and this person is wondering if there is any way that they are able to access film clips that they can incorporate in what they're making. Is there any any avenue for that to happen? Um, have you worked cooperatively with any activists to share pieces of the film? So there's, uh, let me just understand this. I'm gonna look at the question because there's two dif big differences in, in the sense of using clips into an for another film. Uh, I would like to use clips from the movie to help me explain to the people who watching the videos I create and upload. So for this, you have to go to sand because I'm, I'm, I'm not, uh, well, okay. I'm definitely at liberty to say that uh, please don't cut the film and use, <laughs> and, and use it out of context. Um, but we've made this film accessible to everyone. We've had 21 days of conversations uh, where people can come in and watch conversations with Dr. Gabor Mate, Tara Brock, Ilan Pape, uh, Norman Finkelstein, uh, Daniel Mate, we've had Palestinian doctors from Gaza, we've had uh, Palestinian poets, and all of this is available on YouTube. You can watch the 21 conversations leading up to the to the premiere of the film. And the film, you can access it. We were, we had the access until June open um, online, but now it's been extended to the 31st of July. So you can just go on to the, to the website where the olive trees weep, and click to buy and watch the film. And if you don't have money, it's zero donations. So we're making it accessible to everybody. The whole point of this film is to get people to see, watch, move, and act. Uh, and if you go to resources, you'll find a list of 10 things that you can do to support, 10 things that you can do right now immediately in order to help stop this genocide, and organizations that you can support. By watching and donating, the money that is coming from these screenings is going to projects to support the Palestinians. So that's 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 how accessible we also 
uh, have a, you can create a showing, you can show it online, you can show it to your friends. If you want to book a cinema and do it, it's also made very easy by, by a system that we have um, on Kinema. So you can just buy the license, which is very cheap, also $50, and you can get, you can screen it to a cinema and create fundraise also for projects. So please use, use the material with, with, as, as the film itself and share the film for as many people as you want and in your communities, of course. And I'm available right now in the US, so I can also come for Q&As or I can pop online for a QA. and a And yeah, Wonderful. thank you so much. This is amazing, Ashira. Thank you again so much for making this so accessible. And guys, everybody who's watching right now, please, as Ashira said, go on the Where Olive Trees Weep website and you'll have all of that information about how to make donations if you'd like to, if you'd like to just access it to a larger audience, make it accessible to them. This it's just They just make it very easy for you to do something like this. So, And, um, and it also lists who among the people featured in the film you can actually invite for a Q&A for either an in-person screening or a virtual screening. And that's how we were able to get Ashira. Um, so Ashira, we have people joining us from all over the world. And there's some who've been up for quite a while now and it's quite late in the UK. So I just want to get to some of their questions as well. Yeah. Um, so um, we have somebody called Asma Mirza and she asks, hi Ashira, amazing film. At the end of the film is mentioned a trauma center that has now been destroyed by Israelis. Is there work being done on the ground to replace this or make a makeshift center, so to speak? And what current insight can you give us with regards to trauma help that children need on the ground? I have seen lots of encouraging things on Insta where people have set up a mobile school to teach groups of children in kindergarten, yeah. primary school. Um, so... The center that we're talking about is the Noah Center, Noah Cultural Center for Arts. And this is where my project, which is Catharsis Holistic Healing, operates uh, to provide therapy support for children prior to the war. Uh, the center itself, the main building was bombed. And uh, it's through this through the donations that are, are coming for the film, we intend to support the rebuilding of the of the center and to uh, to do the trauma work. I just posted my website and there you can also see if you go to the website you'll go to catharsis and you can see the work that we're doing so we 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 work with uh former child prisoners former women prisoners and we provide now we started in 2018 so now we provide everyone actually with trauma therapy because there's this huge need and we also provide um as of the as of the escalation in the in the ethnic cleansing we have free therapy sessions and it's all liberation therapy in the sense that we work with therapists who know and understand what's happening in Palestine. You don't need to sit and explain to them what is going on or explain or have to like uh, explain yourself. Mm -hmm. And work. we work with modalities that are mainly Im uh, embodied modalities that work for, for our bodies, for occupied uh, black and brown bodies. So you can, and that modality, the, the offering is for Palestinians inside Palestine, in Gaza, in 48, and also for activists around the world. So if we have solidarity activists for Palestine, we don't want them to burn out. So we're also providing them with support. And we're also pa providing uh, Arab, uh, Palestinians and Arab Muslim um, and Christian uh, in diaspora mm -hmm. um, therapy for free. And that's all being done because we have some beautiful four, around 400, 500 volunteers who have, um, who are giving, offering these off th this free therapy. So if you are a therapist and you want to provide the uh, therapy, please uh, come onto the website and send us an email. If you are interested in receiving support, same way, just send us an email and we'll contact you. We're also, as this genocide is continuing, we are also training our trainers. So we have like more train, more of the catharsis family getting trained right now in different modalities that are for like fast interventions. Uh, so that when this, when we have a breath in, in this genocide, our therapists can go and heal. Next week, we're going to have trauma therapy for uh, former uh, women prisoners who just came out of prison and some of them um, were rearrested and they just came out. So we're going to have a, a, a workshop for them inside the occupied areas in Nablus. So we're, this work is going, um, but it's going to get, it's, if I can tell you the magnitude, we need, we need thousands of therapists to work. Uh, and it's something that no one has ever dealt with. Um, it's, it's type of trauma that we haven't seen before or, or experienced. 
So, but if currently right now, because of the situation, as she writes, mostly happening in the West Bank, right? Yes. So we're in the West Bank. In Gaza, we can't offer the building, as I said, is is gone. But still, there are therapists who still want to work. So they're volunteering within their communities. Mm -hmm. um, we don't even know how many staff members are killed from the center. We don't know who's been displaced and who's missing. Um, there's a difficulty in communicating with everyone. Many of them have left and now in Gaza. Our therapist, a beautiful uh, woman who we supported, um, to leave only because she was she's pregnant and she needed immediate care. She's now in Egypt and she's pregnant and supporting children in who fled from Gaza inside Egypt with the support of other therapists, Egyptians there. So we're working in the communities to support the Gazans when they come out until there's a chance, you know, to, to help the people in, in Gaza. But the reality of it is we have also so many therapists who come and they want to volunteer, but we can't we can't send a delegation because of Rafah and also mm -hmm. because you can only build resilience right now, but you can't really work with someone when they don't have water. So the priority is to bring water, to bring food to people, to bring medical aid, and then the intervention of the of mental health to deal with whatever is left in the carnage. Absolutely. Um, Roxanne, do you, would you like to take the next question? Yes, um, we have a question um, from, okay, from Tazin Anam asking, I want your opinion on why the international press is in chains with hands tied when it comes to reporting on the conflict. Why is that? I, I actually do also have the same question. It is so incredibly hard for press, for journalists, and um, you have that direct experience, Ashira. So what, what are your thoughts on that? The situation is horrific for journalists. <laughs> Um, we've lost hundreds of uh, colleagues. Um, we've lost our icon also, Shireen, who was my personally my teacher Abu Akhle, before this genocide even began, because I think they're always preparing for what they will do. It doesn't come out of the blue. And the reality of reporting in Palestine is you, as a journalist, are the target. So if you are to report anything, you and your family are the targets. You become you become the enemy of the state. Um, and journalists have to take that risk every single day, knowing that their mom, their families, their children will be targeted. They went after his they went after his kids, they went after his wife, they killed them. They, we've had journalists, one journalist who was arrested, they waited until his father came to the house so that they can kill his father. Mm -hmm. Um, so the reality of reporting in a, in a genocide is horrific and the reality of why the white <laughs> the white colonialist capitalist media doesn't report on us and report still in the same way is because of what it is it's media that was always operated by uh, authoritarian regimes it's media that's operating since its inception and its creation to support colonization and that is their duty their duty is not for justice, it's not for equality, it's not balanced, it's not fair. And I I worked with the, with the, with the BBC, I worked with different uh, media organizations, and if you're working with anything other than uh, Arab media, and even Arab media is super controlled right now, um, their, their form of what is balanced reporting is reporting what, the, what is uh, in the benefit of the uh, white colonialist governments. It's never, it's never, it's being unbalanced is, uh, for you to be unbalanced means to disregard the victim. Um, and the tools that they provide are tools in, that are made for you not to be able to report. So the agenda which they carry is already uh, an unfair agenda. I remember sitting in board meetings and having to explain why we need to report on uh, the deaths of Palestinians and every time you will have somebody on, on the panel saying no but uh, but this, this how many how many how many points you would prove and we would 
in any media room, and I would like love to be challenged in every single media room, but there's specific details and information that relate to Palestine. So if you're the, the reporter, and I'm sure reporters know this, if you're a reporter and you go right now to report on Ukraine, your story is going to pass in two minutes and your editors are going to let it go. They're not going to scrutinize you in order to release whatever information you want. You go and work as a reporter for Palestine and you will have your whole office. There will be editors assigned specifically to you and there will be a committee to edit your work to, in order to ensure that it doesn't come out. I've worked with so much media and it's the same. It's the same. There's, there's, a, there's a wall and this wall is controlled and maintained by Zionists and by pro-Zionists. Ashira, I mean, on that question, I mean, about the media and how much it is controlled and how much censorship there is, how do you think the past nine months have sort of shifted the discourse, given that people, Palestinians, have life cast their genocide through social media channels? And how has that shifted the discourse, in your opinion? And what has that done? You said, you know, something has to change. Unfortunately, it took 40, more than 40,000 Palestinians being killed in this horrific, horrific manner, and all of that being showcased on social media platforms. How do you think that is going to change the narrative? Yeah, I, I, I say thank God for social media. And at the same time, everything that you're getting is also still being cens censored by Meta. Mm-hmm. We are being our accounts are being shut down. Uh, there's agreements between Meta, between uh, Meta and uh, the Israeli authorities, so that our people can get arrested for posts. Um, they shut us down for for the <laughs> for the watermelon. Even uh, there's control. They 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 realize that social media is a problem, mm-hmm. and it allows for the images to be live streamed. It allows for people to see this genocide clearly. It allows for people to come up out on CNN and be like, but how can you say that the Palestinians, uh, the hospitals are not being bombed when you have a video of a doctor standing in a hospital being uh, being shot at, you know? So you have this, this at least, but like we have to come with evidence in order to prove your case always um, so that you are believed because they know what they're doing. It's not like convincing. It's not convincing. It's it's. They know what is being done and their duty is to shut it down and to make sure that it doesn't come out. But we do see the difference and the change because we have social media and we have some access to some access uh, to that. And that's why Israel, the first thing they wanted to do was cut electricity. The first thing they went after was journalists. They want to make sure that no voices come out and the voices still came out. And you still, there's still media that's operating the, the same Israeli uh, media censor. Israel still operates under <laughs> under um, under military law. So it, in Israel, you're not allowed to post anything um, except if it's uh, if it's approved by the Israeli military censorship. So it's it's the propaganda machine operates as a propaganda machine. It's <laughs> it it feeds the information, and the West blindly followed in uh, in the coverage in uh, October 7th. And now we're just discovering all the lies. Now we're discovering all the numbers. Now we're discovering there's no uh, beheaded babies. Now we're discovering there was no kids thrown in the ovens and their lies are all coming exposed. And it's like too late, too late. You allow The media was actually complicit in this genocide and news channels and p- journalists need to be taken to court for what they have done and their participation, their participation in the genocide. They should not be left behind. They, the CNN, the BBC, the Sky News need to be taken into courts for what they have done because that is participation in the genocide. They allowed and they opened the space, these journalists, for this genocide to take place. Um, and social media is a little bit of an outlet, but we don't know how much mo- for, for how much longer. And you need to understand Palestinians are being persecuted and with the, and the, we're, they're paying with their blood for them for these images to come out. My friend posted, shared a poem, not even an image or something graphic. Israeli army came and arrested him. They, he was just sentenced yesterday to 16 months in prison under torture. He missed the birth of his child and he's lost half of his body weight because Israel is now um, uh, starving the Palestinian hostages. Uh, over 10,000 Palestinian hostages inside Israeli detention centers, torturing them. And this is all for posting on Facebook, for posting a poem. 
not even that he wrote the poem, he shared the poem. So can you imagine the price that we have to pay in order for the story to come out? So that we are believed by the West, it's just very ironic. Thank you, Ashira. Uh, Ashira and, and everyone who's online, um, we we do have another moderator. Um, Claire Schaefer Duffy is with us from the Center for Nonviolent Solutions. She screened the film at the same time in Worcester. Um, she has about 50 people in the room. And she was asking if it for technical reasons, they got 25 minutes behind us. And she's asking if they may still have a chance to ask a question. Um, so uh, Claire, if you can hear us, um, you can go ahead and, and ask a, a question. Okay, we can had some technical issues. That's no well, worries. There's typing something in the chat. Yeah, oh, so okay. just let us know whenever you're ready, Claire, okay. and then we'll we'll take one from the audience in Worcester. So no problem. But in the meantime, if you could just mute yourself, that would be lovely. Um, and so, Roxanne, would you like to take the next question? You're um, muted. Yeah. Okay, now you're fine. Um, we have a question. Uh, do you know whether it's true that Israelis only allow Western journalists into Gaza if they are connected with the IDF? Yeah, so no journalist is allowed to enter Gaza. They're not allowing any journalists from the outside. And if they so come no in, they come, yeah, if they come in, they come in with the military. So you had, I think, you had a CNN reporter uh, go in. Um, and I think they were attached to, um, to the Israeli military. And it was to show that yeah. the hospital, yeah, that was one of the reports I remember seeing. And they had the soldiers with them. Yes. <laughs> and you need to understand, if you're a journalist and you come into Palestine, you have to, you go, you go through the most, rigorous amount of screenings and then when you arrive you are taken by the in order to operate inside uh what's called israel you need to have a israeli uh, government press guard which means that they're monitoring you 24 7 you arrive you get taken to the israeli government office a press office where you're indoctrined with information you're given uh also lots of freebies so they know how to they know how to buy the journalists western journalists who live in tel aviv and jerusalem do not even bother to go into the West Bank except if it's on their own accord because they make their lives so much easier <laughs> they invite them to meets and greets with free alcohol for journalists and they give them briefings and they give them pictures and images and take them on tours to Sderot and take them on tours to wherever it's it's a proper op if you need to think about Israeli media operation it's a proper propaganda machine which is governed controlled by the army. It is an Israeli army body, the media in, inside Israel. And it's sad for the Israelis because they have only, a f there's no media inside Israel that's outside of the military censorship because you get, you, you're not allowed to exist. So you will be um, like, you, can, you you will be fired. The media, the media, basically the newspaper or the radio or TV, whatever will be shut down if you don't follow the Israeli uh, media censorship. So they're controlled <laughs> and sure. they try to control the rest of the world. Sure, thank you for that, Ashira. Um, so we uh, do have a question about the myth of equality for Israeli Arabs living inside Israel. We always get counters to the effect that Israel is a democracy for all its citizens. And Amna is asking if you could um, speak to that notion. Yeah, there's there's no such thing. It, it's, it's a state that is built on racism. Uh, it's built on racism and it's built on discrimination. When they try to create a Jewish state, it's a, it's a state for the Jews and for none, for none other but than the Jews. So there's, it cannot be an, <laughs> a, state, a democratic state when it's a Jewish state. The, the two can't work together because the Jews inherently have more rights inside the Jewish state than any other. And the natives in that land who are non-Jewish don't have the same rights. Um, I hold an Israeli passport. That hasn't stopped them from arresting me. That hasn't stopped them from beating me. That hasn't stopped them from going after me and my family. That it, it's 
there's 41 actual laws, and I think probably they've increased in the last few years, that specifically discriminate against the Arab citizens inside Israel who hold Israeli passports. Then, just to further, that, for your understanding, Ethiopian Jews, when they arrived inside Israel, they were caught to the Israelis, the Israeli authorities, giving them uh, injections so that they can't have children because they didn't want to have too many black babies inside Israel. Until today, inside Israel proper, you will find that there are settlements that are white only, uh, and Jewish uh, Ethiopian Jews are not allowed to live in these neighborhoods. There's discrimination. There's also different levels of Judaism and who is the top. Of course, the top is the, the European Jews, and then you will have, it goes lower and lower, and then you have the Druze, who are not Jewish, but they are in the state and they serve in the Israeli army, who are also discriminated against. And they're the highest level above the Arabs. We come at the lowest of the scale. Unfortunately, uh, well, thank you for explaining that. Um, uh, Roxanne, would you like to take the next question? I think Shafi. Yes, yes, this is very, very personal, Ashira, but I think probably all of us would love to know the answer if there's anything you're comfortable sharing. Um, we have someone who is asking, how, how are you and how is your health? The stories that you told are, how are you, Ashira? I'm tired. <laughs> I'm tired of having to, uh, I'm, I'm tired of having to speak a lot about what's happening and I'm tired of the ignorance. Um, and I'm just amazed and hurt and pained that this genocide is continuing. I My heart is so heavy every time I see the news about the prisoners um, because prisons were already horrible and the torture and detention centers were already horrific. And to think that what I experienced two years ago, like what we've published in the film, was a walk in the park to what's happening now to our prisoners. I never imagined that it could be worse, and it's worse. And I am also away from my home so that this film can come out. And I have these moments where I'm like, is it worth it? Is it worth me uprooting my family so that this can come out and people can see it? Does it make a difference? Versus like my individual um, reality and how much I would rather have my kids grow around their grandparents and to be in, in, in family together. But it was the only thing that I could do at this time um, to wake people up and to also... Yeah, I get torn between these two the, these two hard places, and I know that this is also still comes from a place of privilege. I'm here and I'm safe, and my friends in Gaza are not. There's nothing I can do to save them, and there's nothing I can do to to help these kids that I'm seeing every day, the ones who are losing their entire bloodlines. Absolutely. Yes. Um, Ashira, I was just wondering, were you able, this film came out two years ago, were you able to show it to anybody inside Israel? No, the film came out right now. So it was, I, oh, we, it was filmed we, filmed, in 20... we filmed it two years ago in Palestine. Oh, okay. And it just was released in uh, June. Um, and there are voices that are asking for it to be translated to Hebrew so that they can screen it um i know my like there are friends that are trying to organize screenings inside the west bank um and yeah i don't know how much it will change in the hearts of israelis if they see it <laughs> sure sure um that was just like a follow-up to the last question but i just um wanted to ask shafi had a question about the role of the united nations in all of this you know um how do you feel about that i mean in terms of other like well icj rulings and um you know the cases that were brought against um uh, israel and uh the war crimes that have been committed what do you feel about that role and how how what does that make you feel it's it's also another disappointment um because nothing you know when you give a state a, a, the right of veto you lose all control it's just a, it's just a 
it's like a de- you know when we had when we were kids in school we had the what is it called the model UN and it's just a game it's like a model UN here they so they come out they say something there's some countries but everybody at the end of the day knows that the is that the US is the one participating in this war and they have a veto right so <laughs> what's the point of the UN um and in terms of the ICJ I have it has it was my dream it's one of my my dreams to see Israel be standing in the International Court of Justice and I I'm someone who worked on the documentation uh, of human rights violations and I worked with Human Rights Watch and Amnesty International and it was like and the aim of everything we were doing was that one day they will they will be taken but my realization when I was there was that it's gonna it's taken us too long to recognize that this is an apartheid and by the time we report it's an apartheid it's going to be a genocide and it what's the point what's the why do we have to prove to the world that it's an apartheid or it's a genocide when we're getting killed and there's images and there's numbers and people are dying Gaza is obliterate, oblit, obliterated there's you just need one drawn picture of Gaza to know what is what has happened and we still have to prove to this western countries that we are being eradicated and they are paying their money to do it so i i i'm i'm i don't want to like dishearten people it was great what south africa did and it's great because <laughs> the court actually made rulings <laughs> and nobody listened <laughs> it's as if those rulings never existed in the, if it were if this was russia oh my god what sanctions would be put Oh my God, if it was the precious white Ukrainians, my God, being killed right now, uh, the UN would be quivering, right? And there would be sanctions. Um, but at the end of the day, the US controls the, U- the United Nations. They hold the veto. And until, inshallah, Russia and China get out and say this is not fair game, <laughs> there's nothing that can be changed from there. Israel doesn't care and Israel knows they don't care. It, it, it's like asking the Ameri- asking Israel to minimize the attacks in Rafah and to stop the genocide while by the American judges while the US is sending the bombs it's the, they're sending the bombs they're giving actual bombs the kids in Gaza are playing with bombs that have made in the USA on them and we're expecting justice from these people If anything is to happen, is to say, خلاص, يعني, get, uh, destroy the UN. Ashira, we're also very mindful of your time. I know that you had joined us for about 40, 45 minutes. So I'm just wondering, do you um, have time for like one more question or um, just please let us know? Yes. Rox- I, see, uh, I can see this is the questions. Where are they? Yes, so- I understand. I think that if it's possible, I think we can end on a more hopeful note. And we have a question from Alicia Ali asking, um, I know there's such a long way to go and it's not nearly enough. But as more and more people around the world are seeing and hearing the stories of what is happening to the Palestinian people, people are being informed and joining the cause. Do you feel or see that any change is happening? Of course. I was just asked this question and I'm like, and people were saying like, but it's been nine months and all the protests didn't do something. I'm like, there's people still in Gaza. (laughs) Do you understand what this genocidal, psychotic evil instrument called Israel was planning to do? They were planning on completely wiping out Gaza. It's not... They they didn't succeed in the genocide. And I I get upset when people say the word genocide. I'm like, and I use it because just to try to explain it. But the reality is it's not a genocide because each and every one of you acted. It's a genocide if there's not one Palestinian left in Gaza. But because people marched in the streets, because Israel had to pay the price for the first time to see people divesting and they got scared, 
they didn't wipe the last Palestinians standing in Gaza. We still have some Palestinians on that land. So we're grateful, alhamdulillah, that we have people. Alhamdulillah, that we still have a few build, small buildings uh, there. Alhamdulillah, that now the center that we want to rebuild is still, we've got the structure. <laughs> so it's there. The, what people did made a difference and what happened did make a difference. It's just that we're not expecting the change to come from the UN. We're expecting the change to come from you. We're expecting the change to come from the pressure that's going to come from you. What is what was what happened in France and what happened in the UK gives us hope that it's happening. <laughs> For people to teach those politicians that if you continue to support genocide, you're out. That's what we need. It's the people that are making the decisions. And Israel, trust me, they are mindful of this. When I arrived here in the US, every day you open any instrument, any social media, you see millions of dollars spent by Israelis in APAC to change the US uh, public opinion. Advertisements, come to Israel, plant some strawberries, birthright. It's like filling up with all these things because they want to change the opinion and they are scared. If they weren't scared, trust me, there won't be one of us left in that land. If they weren't, if they weren't affected by what happened in the streets, the only reason we haven't been wiped out is because you spoke out and people are speaking out and people are waking up. So I have hope. The moment I saw the students marching in the streets, I had hope. I was I woke up in Ramallah and it, and we weren't able to march in Ramallah because the Palestinian Authority was coming after us so that they will silence us against standing with Gaza. And we saw students marching in London and we were like, thank you. We have hope. Every penny that's being divested, every penny that's not going to the Israeli army is going to, and if it's, if it's going, hopefully it will go to local, uh, local, uh, local shops and so that we can also kill the American globalized instrument that destroys small businesses, this capitalist dream uh, of theirs is hope for all of us and and as 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 a woman of faith i know in my heart i have yaqeen and faith 100 percent that we are going to be free and it's just living through the last few miles and surviving them and surviving them with grace just as the people of Gaza have done they're surviving it with grace and every one of us can do something and we are trying to do something and you did a very great thing to move it forward by making this film and sharing the film and all of us who have seen the film and who are learning more and more are taking action and and i believe that if all of us do something who who know about what's happening it it will change it will change and we are recording this we will send it out to everyone who shared their email with us. We did have 500 tickets, as Malika mentioned. Um, we will send this out to everyone with a summary, with some actions of what people can be doing, in addition to the information that you provided about your website and also the Where All of Trees Weep website. And we can all personally take some action and not be helpless bystanders. Um, and that is what we will do. Um, so we will send that out to to everyone um, our tomorrow. <laughs> so it's it's evening on the east coast of the United States. We will package up the recording of this wonderful session with you, Ashira and with some actions that people can take and some website information and send that out to everyone tomorrow. And we are so grateful for everything that you have done. We really Thank appreciate you. it. Thank and, you. And for you sh sharing your story and your time. We yeah. thank you very, 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 very much. I think you've inspired so many more people tonight, Ashira. Thank you so much. There's already a lot happening in our communities, but you provided that extra propulsion and inspiration. So we really, really appreciate everything. So thank you all so much for joining us tonight. And um, we hope that you will stay in touch. Please visit our website, ca4pj.org, to stay in touch. Hello. 
Good night, everyone.